uh, just very slowly. <laughs> um, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's panel, um, panel on contraception. Um, the UN published a report two years ago, and um, it counted the number of people who can become pregnant in the world, and it counted 1.9 billion people. Uh, more than half of them need um, family planning or have a need for family planning, uh, meaning being able to decide for themselves um, whether to have children, how many and when and at what intervals. Um, plus, even if there is no, even if they don't want any children, sexuality also plays a role, right? Sexuality must be able to be experienced without fear of any unwanted pregnancies. And contraceptives or contraception plays a central role here. Um, but there's still so much wrong, so very much wrong with uh, contraception these days. Um, first, contraceptives are not accessible to everyone. Sometimes they're too expensive or they're too stigmatized or people just don't really know about them that much. Um, but then there's the other side of the story, the one we didn't really talk about, the one we don't really talk about that often, which is um, the story that in many countries of the world, long-term contraceptive methods um, and sterilization procedures are still used without informed consent. And as a result, self-determined family planning is not possible there. It's even worse than that. I mean, in the, in the previous panel that we had in this discussion series on reframing reproduction, we um, talked a lot uh, about this very topic, about population policy and about the, well, the so-called overpopulation myth. And um, we had invited Setampiso Promis Metembu. She is the co-founder of Her Rights Initiative in South Africa. And she was part of our last um, panel last, uh, two weeks ago. And um, she said that for many women, the discussion around contraception in, and racism, unfortunately, kind of go hand in hand. So all in all, as you can see, it's a very complex topic. Um, and all the more glad I am today that I get to talk about this um, with our panelists today. Um, before I... Um, before I introduce them to you, but I will first like to talk a little bit about some, some technical stuff. Um, please know that uh, this video is recorded and live streamed. Um, you can write your questions in the group chat. We have a Q&A session for um, this uh, panel. Feel free to raise a hand or and ask a question. At the end of our session, um, meaning we'll talk about, we'll talk with each other for about an hour, but then you'll have 30 minutes for um, your questions and feedback and comments. Um, you can also tweet about this event or share your thoughts about the topic um, online. You can use our hashtags to connect with others who are also participating today um, or to let your followers know about what it is that you do on an afternoon like this or in the morning uh, for Heather. <laughs> um, the hashtags you can find in the chat. Um, also the Heinrich Bell Stiftung has generously made translation available um, to German, French, and Spanish, and you can access it at the little globe at the bottom of the screen, and it should work perfectly. Now, without further ado, um, to our panel panelists, um, welcome everyone on stage. Um, I am so, so excited to be in this conversation with you today. Um, we talked a little bit about what it is that we're going to speak about today, but um, not but. I think it's going to be amazing. Um, first, we have Jana Fenning. Two years ago, Jana Fenning founded the initiative Better Birth Control together with Rita Malio. The initiative raises awareness for contraception and advocates free and better uh, contraceptives for everybody. Recently, they achieved to integrate their demands in the German Coalition Treaty of 2021. And uh, Jana is currently obtaining a master's degree in international relations and economics in Berlin while doing all of that. Welcome, Jana. Heather, Heather Vadad, um, 
Heather is the executive director uh, of the Male Contraceptive Initiative, MCI. She has over 15 years of experience in biological, behavioral, and clinical research and has managed female and male contraceptive development portfolios that span the whole product development spectrum from early stage, proof of concept activities through non-clinical and clinical phases, as well as global product registration introduction. Heather, I'm so happy that you're with us today. And Marina Davidashvili. Marina is the head of policy and research at the European Parliamentary Forum on Sexual and Reproductive Rights. Um, short, EPF. EPF is a network of members of parliament throughout Europe who are committed to protecting the sexual and reproductive rights of the world's most vulnerable people, both at home and overseas. The Secretariat is based in Brussels, but Marina, today you are joining us from Barbados, no? Yes, we are here on, on we are organizing a meeting with members of parliament from Latin America and the Caribbean to talk about the same issue, but in this region. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, at EPF, Marina, you lead comparative research projects such as the European Contraception Policies Atlas, um, Abortion Policy Atlas, and you engage in parliamentary advocacy at um, European and national level, now on international level. <laughs> Welcome uh, to all three. Thank of you. you. Um, I'm so, so excited. Um, yeah, let's begin. Marina, I would actually like to begin with you um, and with your research at EPF. Um, you have co authored the Contraception Atlas, um, it's a map that scores 46 countries throughout Europe on access to modern contraception since 2017. Um, what have you found out? Tell us a little bit about the Atlas. Um, yes, good morning, first of all, uh, Sham, and I'd like to thank very much the organizers for inviting us. I'm really excited to participate, even from so far away and with time difference, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. So yes, indeed, maybe just to set the, to set the framework, uh, I'd like to say that um, even though Europe has one of the highest contraceptive prevalence rates and lowest abortion rates in the world, still today, 35% of pregnancies in Europe are unintended. And um, only 56% of women use contraception. And um, so we do um, annual, uh, annual research and we launch it every uh, Valentine's Day, in fact, uh, on 14th February about um, uh, where our European countries stand in terms of access uh, to contraception, to counseling and to information. So we look at three uh, criteria and um, we don't look at the health uh, indicators. So we don't look at the prevalence rate. This um, is, these are other organizations that look at that. Maybe I'll just show you the map so you can visualize it. And um, uh, I'll try to see if I can do this. Oh, I cannot find uh, one moment. I'll try something else, sorry. <laughs> Uh, technology. Um, I took a look at it um, at the mm -hmm. Atlas the other day. Okay, there wow, we go. So much data. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a lot of data, and the point is actually to. Can you see it now? Yes, we can see. Yeah. So uh, the, the point is actually, since the health systems are very different in each country, this is an attempt to have a one visual visualization, if you want simplification and comparing national health systems, which are difficult to compare. And uh, so what you can see the first of all, maybe that is striking is the difference between East and West. So how do we do this? Of course, this is a traffic light system. Uh, light green, uh, green, dark green and light green are better. Then you have orange and then you have red that goes into the, uh, into the east. And um, so what we find is that, um, maybe I'll just go to the next one, that the countries that have first place so our champions, as we call them, this is Belgium, France, and United Kingdom. And then they are followed by other countries. And in the red category, where the, so the, the way we go to the right is that the services of the government are decreasing in terms of access. And unfortunately, yeah, Eastern countries are in the very poor section or poor section. 
where um, governments do almost nothing or nothing uh, in terms of allowing citizens to and people residing in the territory to access uh, contraceptives. So what uh, do France, uh, Belgium and United Kingdom do well is that they provide, uh, I'll go back here, so you can see it. They, uh, first of all, provide um, either fully covered or reimbursed um, supplies, so contraceptives to uh, old people, to young people, to vulnerable people, and uh, counseling is also covered. And uh, there is a governmental website. So that means if you Google for example, contraception, you will find, and in the era of myths and so much fake news, we, we consider that government has a responsibility to inform its citizens about um, evidence-based um, uh, uh, information on contraception. And so these countries, and, so, and many others, not only the champion ones, but all that are in the green, green um, section, light green, uh, dark green, they have governmental uh, websites with information, with um, even decision aid, so you can see what method is good for you uh, based on your situation. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's very uh, useful and very good. So overall, what are the findings are that um, only 30 or 28 percent of countries um, provide supplies to young people. So these are 17 countries. And here it's not only European Union, it's the whole Europe. So um, geographical Europe, Council of Europe member states. And 41%, um, uh, so that is 19 countries, they offer contraception to adult population. And also regarding what you talk, talked about, long-acting contraception, um, which are um, sometimes, uh, it's, a, it's a big amount to pay at once, but overall it, it gives a very good, um, it has a very good efficiency rate, yeah. So al also uh, 19 countries provide uh, long-acting contraception in their national health system, either fully reimbursed or partially reimbursed. And um, at the same time, yeah, uh, not uh, no progress at all in Eastern Europe. EU member states, like Slovakia, Greece, Croatia, Hungary, Poland are among the worst performing. So it's very unfortunate. Outside the EU, it's also not so good. And we can say that while there is progress, for instance, last year, there were six countries in Europe that adopted a, a policy that improved the access. For example, France last year adopted a, a measure that uh, gives free contraception to young women up to 25. And they followed Belgium because there was a competition. We sometimes get letters from Minister of Health. How can we be better than our neighbor? It's, um, this map inspires a bit of Eurovision competition spirit, but in, in a nice way. So there is a competition between France and Belgium, sometimes between uh, Portugal and Spain and, and Italy and so on. So it's, it's, um, it's uh, good that uh, this research uh, has led to this. So Belgium did the measure for to cover uh, contraception for young for young people up to 25 uh, two years ago. France now followed, so that's a good sign. Also Lithuania and um, United Kingdom, Ireland, uh, I can give more details if needed. And um, yeah, but overall, I have to say that access to modern and effective contraception still um, remains a challenge. So we need to, to work more to make sure that this whole continent becomes green. Okay, I think I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Wow. I mean, I have a follow up question. Um, I mean, compared to, let's say, other other years before 2017, has it become better or worse? I can't really tell. Um, yes, it is becoming better uh, since we started la launching the Atlas. Uh, we have around 20, 22 new policies that were adopted on different things. Uh, for example, sometimes it's improvement in terms of um, uh, like coverage to young people. Sometimes it's, uh, for example, UK now uh, made uh, pill um, to, to be available without uh, prescription. And uh, so it's just over the counter, you can get it without prescription. That is also mm -hmm. rare. And, um, and so on. At the same time, we notice that the improvements are only on the West side, 
not so much on, on the east, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so the only eastern uh, from country from the east is Lithuania that um, last year, um, from last year started to cover uh, long acting contraception for, uh, for young women free of charge. They provide um, a drug called Levon, Levon Gestrel, mini IUD, it's free of charge. Mm -hmm. And Moldova is scoring well and uh, thanks to great work also of civil society there, uh, advocating for the government. Otherwise, um, um, this part of, of Europe is, is lagging behind, while it's, it's if you want, it's uh, two different uh, speeds that uh, our continent is moving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much, Marina. I mean, I have uh, a thousand questions left, but um, I'll... I'll... I'll, and I'll probably post them to you or write them to you in an email later. But sure. um, everybody else in the chat who is participating, please also feel free to, whenever you have a question, please feel free to um, ask uh, in the chat. Uh, this is supposed to be a conversation as well. Um, and we have uh, these amazing panelists uh, to guide us uh, in during this conversation. Um, Jana. I don't know if you if you saw it, but according to Marina's atlas, only three countries uh, in Europe, which is France, Belgium, and the UK, have excellent um, general reimbursement schemes uh, for contraception. Um, Jana, you are in Germany, um, and Germany is not one of those uh, three countries. I reckon this is one of the reasons you started better birth control, right? Yes, exactly. That's one of the reasons why we started it, because me and my friend Rita, we founded Better Birth Control together uh, in the beginning of 2020, actually. So it's not a long time ago where we realized that actually there's there's a lot of wrong with contraception as it is today in Germany. Um, when talking to friends or colleagues, um, we or like like people we study with, we realized that um everyone in our friends group everyone in our peer group is so unhappy with the way their contraception is like for men there are hardly any options besides the condom or vasectomy but it's not reversible so it's not an option for young men who might want to have children still um and for women there are plenty of methods but most of them contain a lot of side effects like depression headaches like feeling unwell um, or increased period pain and so on and so forth. We probably all know these lists. So we thought, well, that's super unfair. Additionally, contraception is pretty expensive in Germany. Um, after turning 22, the government doesn't pay anymore. Or the health insurance system in Germany doesn't pay anymore for contraception. So, but why is it 22? We thought that makes no sense because a lot of people after 22, they do not intend to have children yet. They are maybe still in school and university or doing a Ausbildung as we call it in Germany. So it, it doesn't say that once you turn 22, you have enough money to finance it yourself. And also there's no medical reason for that weird 22 year old barrier. Um, so yeah, we thought it's all super unfair and also the way um, contraception is being taught in Germany in schools, but also the way gynecologists talk about contraception is, um, yeah, it's very, there's a lot to improve there. Uh, it's, it's, it's not really good at the moment. So that's why we, we started better birth control. Um, and yeah, but I'm also very interested to hear from you, Marina, um, what do you think makes the difference between Germany and the top ranking countries like the UK, um, Belgium and France. Um, shall I answer, Sham? Yes, please. <laughs> yes, okay. So I'm, I'm just looking, so this is our poster. <laughs> so behind, it's, it's available on our website. I, I'll put the link afterwards. I looked at Germany and why indeed uh, Germany is not, um, is not in the champion. Uh, list. However, Germany is an, it's a light grid, so it's the next good um, category. So first of all, because as you said, because Germany doesn't cover contraception for general population, so you need to, to pay it, and it's only covering young people until uh, young age, so 22. 
And also, um, as far as I know, but please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there used to be schemes for vulnerable people and afterwards they were removed. So people who have um, financial difficulties long time ago, they were in, entitled to receive free contraception, now no longer. So this also takes points out. And um, at the same time, counseling is, is, is good, it's covered. Uh, from what I heard uh, in Germany, our partners who help us, of course, with this research, uh, it is just put um, as a general consultation. So then you can get reimbursed for it. Um, and you have a, a good website uh, with information. So, but the main challenge is that the, that the supplies are not, the are not reimbursed. Yeah. If you want, I can answer and that again, like, yes, um, yeah. Um, <laughs> the the scheme in Germany for like um, for uh, people uh, to pay it like poorer people to get the money it depends on the, the state where you're at actually like in Bremen and Berlin there is um, a, a way to to get funding if you don't have money to pay your contraception but in most other or in all other states at the moment there is nothing um, but yeah, hopefully that's gonna change soon. And um, and but but I also have a, a co funny comment to make, or I I don't know, like what I realized from our community and what our like what the people in Germany say about their way to get information about contraception from their doctors, where you say in your analysis that it's that it is covered by the insurance, and that's true. But uh, the, the way doctors give information is, is very, very limited. So it's really bad. And mostly it's just a five minutes talk and then it's over. Like, uh, here you have the pill. The other option is birth control pill. Like, maybe they show you two different options. But th like many people in our community in Germany tell us that they were not, uh, t like, didn't get any information about the the side effects or anything they were just to told to to just take yeah. it and the reason for this is actually quite interesting because we also talk to a lot of gynecologists about this and they say from the german health insurance alliance they get seven euro fifty or something for this talk mm. so we 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 can all assume how much um worth seven euro fifty is for a medical treatment for a a doctor um so well, it's i can nothing see, i can see anna you've really gotten uh, down to the details i love it um i have i have some other questions for you <laughs> um i mean that's exactly what happened to me um in germany as well that's kind of like the, the conversation that you have at the doctor when you're younger and you wanna you wanna have that conversation I mean, but it's still, as we say it in Germany, it's like, I guess it's like, Yaman auf hohem Niveau, as in like, we're all, we're, we're all is it, complaining at a very high level, because <laughs> I mean, we're all, we are in the, we are in the green area, there are so many other things that we can do. Um, Heather, uh, while Jana is focusing on contraception uh, better for women and men, um, you, on the other hand, have a slightly different focus. Uh, you want to bring back the discussion or you want to maybe start uh, the discussion in some spaces even, but you want to talk about male contraception uh, or contraceptives for men um, and or contraceptive methods um, for men. Um, how come? Tell us a little bit about your work and your focus. Sure. Thank you. And um, I want to echo Marina and saying thank you for having me today. And I'm so excited to be here at the panels. And in fact, Marina, I literally just had to reach over and pull this out. <laughs> oh, so great. I keep this right here next to me. So it's I'm fangirling a little bit. I love the map. So um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the 2019 version. So if we need historical reference, just let me know and I can <laughs> flip back and forth. Um, so thank you. Yeah, you know, I'm with an organization, as you mentioned, called Male Contraceptive Initiative. We were founded in 2014 um, by uh, a researcher and some colleagues who had been working in the female contraceptive space and had been advocating for more male contraceptive methods um, throughout their careers. Um, and then when they retired, they decided to set up MCI as a means of um, building awareness and advocacy for male methods. Um, 
there's been a lot of mythology around the idea that men aren't interested in using contraception and that women won't trust men to use contraception. So we um, spend a lot of our time sort of reframing the conversation to, to pull in the title of the conference actually. So um, in 2017, we started grant making. So right now we have two core areas of our practice. The first is funding research and development of new non-hormonal male contraceptive methods. Um, the reason we focus on non-hormonal is there's already people out there that are doing good work with the hormonal methods um, for men, including the big nesterone testosterone trials that are going on globally um, at 11 different sites around the world. Um, and those are going well. And so we wanted to focus on this area. Um, and we fund in the neighborhood of 1.2 to 1.5 million US dollars per year in research um, for the development of these new methods. However, anybody who knows about drug development knows that's a mere drop in the bucket for trying to develop methods. So we believe profoundly that one of the biggest actions that we can take as humans to change the world as we know it is to have reproductive autonomy. And, you know, Jan has already mentioned this, that half of the global population does not have a lot of options to choose from. So men have condoms, which, you know, when used properly are highly effective, but they generally aren't used properly. So the rate is about 15 in every thousand um, pregnancies and every 1,000 women, there's a pregnancy associated with a failed condom use. And then you have uh, vasectomy on the other end of the spectrum that's permanent. And what's sort of frightening is that we're hearing a lot of young people thinking that, and this ties into more of what we've already talked about, which is the education and the counseling that's needed. A lot of young men will be reaching out to us and saying, hey, I'm thinking about getting just a vasectomy for now and I'll reverse it later. And sort of this cavalier sense that you can reverse a vasectomy as it's meant to be. Um, so we do a lot of, of clarifying around that, that vasectomy is meant to be permanent. While it can be reversed, that is not what you should be going into a method like that for. So that's the one arm is the research and the development. And then the other arm is advocacy at the, at the individual level. So we do a lot of work, you know, just letting people know that we exist, frankly. So you know, there's not a lot of funding, as we all know, in the contraceptive space generally. So then take that and imagine a, a smaller portion of that, which is male contraception. So as I mentioned, we fund 1.1 or 1.2 to 1.5 million a year. We're the second largest funder of male contraception. So that's pretty striking. There's a long way to go financially to support the development of female and male contraceptive methods. So as you mentioned, Prior to my time at MCI, I spent many years working in female contraceptive product development. So I do feel like there's plenty of room for improvement there as well. So I feel like we view this as a, a second phase in the contraceptive um, universe, I guess. So, you know, contraception today has been inextricably linked with the women's rights movement and women's autonomy and ability to complete our educations and have our careers and we have focused all of our efforts on developing methods for women, which was the right thing to do. And we need to continue to do that, but we also need to start bringing men into the picture more because, you know, it's not an either or. So when we talk about trust, if a female partner does not trust her male partner to contracept, then both can. And right now that's not an option. So um, it's just something that we feel like is, is, sorry to use such a base phrase, but a no brainer to get men involved. And um, we're, we're seeing a lot of positive feedback, especially in younger populations. There's a real almost expectation. Like I, this is what I love about young people today is, is they're, they're not standing for the way things have always been. So we have a youth advisory board that we work with that's um, uh, 18 to 28 year olds. And Really, it's about getting their voice in this development process because these methods are for them. I'm not going to be using these methods. My colleagues aren't. This is for the next generation and giving them what we all feel like they deserve and what we wish we had. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, I see a raised hand, Naida. <laughs> Thank you. If I may, 
Um, now, with for Heather, now with everything that's been going on in the United States um, around the abortion um, draft of law, and so that's on one hand, hopefully it will not happen. And then on the other hand, if the contraception is not provided due to different reasons, be it you know conservatives or whatever, do you see this now a good? Because usually contraception is related to women when we talk about contraceptives. Do you see, is your initiative now a great um, platform for you to expand in your work? I mean, it was just, it's curious because it's very interesting times if I can put it that way in the United States. Indeed, interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's, it is a question that's been coming up a lot this year and particularly in the past couple of weeks, as you can imagine. Um, I, I, it's, a, it's an interesting question because we've seen demand. There is a global um, user demand research activity that's going on um, that we hope to have results from later this summer that's happening in eight countries and nine geographies. We're very excited about those data because it's going to, we believe, unequivocally demonstrate that the demand isn't new, the interest isn't new. Um, I think the attention is on a, a media level and maybe a policy level. Um, I think the biggest challenge is you'll hear people say we need more money, you know, to develop these methods, but male and female again. But I think what people don't realize is the pharmaceutical industry is not involved in, the, in, in developing these methods. We, all of our research that we're supporting comes from philanthropic and private uh, donations. Um, and a lot of folks also don't realize that a lot of um, the more recent female methods that were developed, the intrauterine systems like Mirena and the implants like Jadel, were actually primarily developed through public and philanthropic dollars. So pharmaceutical R&D dollars have not contributed to an advancement in contraception better than 30 years. So we are starting to see a bit more interest, but I think the model still stands in this um, approach that's known as de-risking. So it's this idea that pharma will pick up an interest in a licensing or what have you, but maybe in phase two of clinical. And there's a lot of money that's spent between the bench top and phase two of clinical. So, you know, I think that's another big piece that's missing in the story. So we're having that conversation now because you know, with the conversation about Roe versus Wade in the U.S., people are, are obviously disturbed and, and concerned about what this means and looking to, you know, other options. We're still hoping that this, this will maybe wake up and, and this won't be the case because, you know, reproductive rights are something MCI fights for without question. Our, our vision statement is reproductive autonomy for all. And you know, if nothing else, maybe that will get the conversation going that we need better methods so that we can address unintended pregnancies before we get to a point where abortion has to come into the conversation. So sorry, that was a bit circuitous. I hope that answered your question. Thank you so much. Maida seems content. <laughs> um, we have uh, another question in the chat. Um, uh, her name is Rosemary Onchari. I hope I said your name correctly. Um, a journalist from Kenya is, uh, has also joined us, but she has a question from Marina about uh, data for African countries. Uh, Marina, you and I, we talked about this a little bit to, in our uh, pre-call to this um, discussion today. Um, Rosemary, if it's okay, I will ask this question on behalf of you a little bit later on in the discussion. I still have a few questions left for Heather on, um, well, research for male contraceptives and um, I, I, but uh, just be assured um, that we will also talk a, little, a lot about Africa as well. Um, not only because we had well, there's so much, I, I can see so many links between last, last time's panel discussion and today's. Um, Heather, one other question. You, I mean, you've mentioned that there's so little research uh, that has been done on male contraceptives. Um, why has it been like that? Why, why has there been so little attention? So just, a, there's a lot of ongoing research. So there's, there's really, um, dedicated 
I'm very biased, but the researchers in this space are really amazing because they have carried the development of these products on a shoestring budget in the best of times over decades. So I, I there's immediately names that are coming to mind of, of our colleagues that we fund um, that have just been cobbling together funds to keep this alive. So I, but to answer your larger question about why is one, I think the point I made earlier about, I think we view contraception, we have viewed contraception as a women's only issue. So, you know, once we got the pill, we took off and we ran with it. And as women, we've sort of accepted the side effects that come with that and all of the issues that come with that as, as part of the deal. And again, we're coming out of that a bit now and saying, mm, actually, maybe dealing with side effects isn't good enough. We, you know, we're often, I'm going to coin two of my colleagues, one who says um, that women are often put in a position of choosing the least worst option for contraception. And another colleague that says men are not viewed as reproductive beings. Um, and I think both of those points are, are really profound. And, and I think all of this is converging. So I think that as women are demanding fewer side effects, um, that brings into the conversation, you look around like, well, I can't do it, maybe my partner can. And so there's going to be cases, you mentioned the unintended, or excuse me, the unmet need for contraception globally. Um, that is a huge number. And there is a subset of that, but again, there, there are no data because all of our data that we collect on contraception is regarding women. So we don't know what unmet need is for men, but there's almost certainly a percentage of unmet need that will be met by bringing more male methods into the mix. So, you know, I spoke to um, a couple in Delhi in their home in, you know, this, this urban slum. And I was sitting in their house and the husband said, I just wish there was something that I could take so that she didn't have to deal with the side effects. So it's really going to take a reframing of our entire, <laughs> just one small step, reframing of our entire social view of reproductive health and reproduction in general. So um, I think that that's happening. Yeah. Marina, um, we have seen, well, when we've now looked a little bit at research conducted on male contraception, right? Um, where does the, where does EPF um, stand on male contraception? Is there any research that you're doing? Um, on that specific topic? Um, yes, so first of all, um, we are also very much looking forward when uh, these methods will become more diverse and not so limited as today so that men can also take a proactive role in this reproductive process. We look in our atlas, we look at uh, all range of contraception that uh, is being covered. So everything that is currently uh, available in terms of research and on the market also whether the governments um, contribute whether the governments take that into consideration in their public health schemes and um, for example because of the, the, this um, issue is quite interesting we introduced this year a new criteria where we looked at also long-acting cont contraception whether they are included as they are most efficient whether they are included of course not all larks as they call are male ones, um, are, are male contraception, uh, but uh, it's interesting to see that uh, 41 countries do include long-acting reversible methods, uh, but as I said, it's not uh, always uh, vasectomy, yeah? so it's, it can be also for women, the methods. And um, another, what we looked at is, of course, yeah, provision of condoms, and this is also usually included um, in, in the coverage. So that's that's all what, uh, what we do. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jana, Heather just said something really interesting that stuck with me. She said, she talked a little bit about also the side effects of female contraception, right? That it's like, it's a huge topic. Women have had to put up with these for years. And this is also something that you also criticize at Better Birth Control. Um, what is it that's, what, what are your demands here? Well, we are demanding that, um, yeah, you can hear me, sorry. Uh, we are demanding that the pharmaceutical industry does research to reduce the side effects. And in the past decades, we have actually seen um, reverse tendencies. Um, I don't know if you know it, but um, 
like there are you can you can divide the pill the the birth control pill into four generations first second third and fourth generation and it is actually the fact that the pills of the third and the fourth generation which have been developed in the 80s and 90s and also a bit in the 2000s now so pretty modern and new contraceptive pills have more side effects than the older generation of the second birth control pill they have a higher risk to get a thrombosis the risk to get a thrombosis in these new generation pills has even doubled and now you would think like why does the pharmaceutical industry does that like getting a thrombosis is is a risk for a woman's life even and um, why why did this risk increase and i think the explanation is pretty or super sad uh, once once all pharmaceutical companies had a birth control pill on the market um there was competition and a way to market the birth control pills and to sell it to do marketing for us it was to um to make it a lifestyle thing so when you take the pill you get nicer hair better skin um a more womanly i don't know body shape and all these were points that were advertised to sell the birth control pills but also these increased side effects to have nicer skin and so on. Um, this also increased the risk of getting a thrombosis. And this is super, uh, this is a sad development. Actually, it should be, there should be research to reduce the side effects and not to increase them. And this is something we criticize and where we, where we make aware, like we, we create this awareness in the public and politics, but also uh, try to convince um, producers in the pharmaceutical industry to to change that and to again do research in other directions. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Jana, at our last panel, Promise um, said something that um, I still think about today. She um, said, with regards to what contraceptives mean to different women, right? You've just mentioned, you know, well, we talked about this a little bit, right? Um, Heather has also mentioned this, that it's kind of like, a, you know, women's empowerment also. It's something that um, is often framed as something very positive, right? Um, and she said something, and I'll, I'll, I wrote it down so that I remember it. She said, of course, you will find certain women and women of the particular class who say contraceptives are good because, you know, for some women, it does allow them to exercise their reproductive rights. And in some instances, find that um, when you look at the big goal, she says, this had nothing to do with women's rights um, and has a lot to do with racism. She's um, made that point quite clear a lot um, for, for women, for example, uh, for example, um, women living in the so-called global south. Um, is this perspective one that you have also included um, in better birth control as well? Is that something um, that you yeah, come across in, in your campaigning? Oh, so you're, you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And that's something we come across also. And um, obviously, we oppose those racist structures and um, yeah, um, yeah, racist campaigns. Um, I mean, we are mostly based in German speaking countries. So Switzerland, Austria, Germany, that's where our community is from. And often when people hear from our campaign to to improve the access to contraceptions, that's also one one of our aims. People like, <laughs> I don't know, some people say um, maybe mostly older people like, oh, that's great. Uh, then people in the global south can also have contraception and then we won't have the this whole issue with overpopulation and um, that's that's a very stupid argument we always try to clear it up because um, it is not about reducing the birth rates in the global south uh, so these people don't come to our countries or something that's something we hear that I, I find that horrible I don't want I don't even want to recite that um, um, but and we, we try to clear it up and, and tell the people also to to make we want to clear up the stereotype of overpopulation and so on. All UN estimations show that there we, we do not have to fear an overpopulation uh, nowhere. And um, yeah, th that's something we hear a lot, unfortunately. But yeah, we're trying to educate those people who who say that. Thank you so much. 
Marina, now we come to Africa a little bit. We've, we've talked a lot about Europe. We've talked about uh, the US. Um, uh, you've also published an atlas on Africa. Um, what are the main topics there um, as opposed to your atlas on Europe? Do you see a difference in how, let's say, contraceptive methods are being applied in, in well, due to post-colonial structures? Um, yeah. Um, yes, so thank you for the question. And uh, we do, um, we did uh, launch um, uh, Africa edition two years ago. So um, I will screen it for you so you can visualize it as well. Uh, just bear with me, please, one moment. Okay. Uh, so is it visible now? Yeah, okay. So, um, so uh, this is a map also of 54 countries in African continent. And the idea is uh, quite similar, but the ratings that we used uh, are a bit different from Europe because of course we needed to take into consideration the different political and economical context of the continent. So we again looked at contraception, at policies and funding for contraception, but we added another dimension uh, about um, international commitments. So whether, whether the country made international commitments on contraceptives, so whether the countries are on track may, may meeting those commitments. And we also looked at the level of dependence to external donors, because as, as we all know, there, are, there is a big presence of donor agencies. In, uh, in Africa, but also overall in the whole global south, um, assisting governments in making better policies. Um, at the same time, there is a, a level of dependency on them in terms of providing. And um, in some countries, there is um, an, a, a donor agency that provides the whole supplies to the state. And um, so what did we find out is, first of all, maybe, you, so you can see there is also a bit of a tendency towards the uh, East to have uh, better scores. Uh, in terms of what countries are scoring really well is um, well, Mozambique, Seychelles, South Africa, Ghana, Kenya, Morocco. What does this mean? Is that in these countries, um, there is a wide choice and um, no, there's no restriction on access or um, based on age, based on marriage and so on. And um, they've made international commitments, they're on track with them. They have also um, budget lines on family planning. And um, uh, there's a national health insurance fully or partially, which covers fully or partially contraceptives. And in the public sector, there is no fee taken and uh, there is moderate or no donor dependence. Now, this is of course on paper. Uh, the reality can be very different. And of course, with the Atlas, it's because we look at so many countries, it's quite impossible to do uh, regions within one country. So for example, you can have policies that are better applied in the cities and worse applied in the rural area, but you have that also in Europe. Then uh, the red countries that are scoring really low is um, Chad, Congo, Republic of the Congo, Guinea, Sudan, Eswatini, DRC and Comoros. And uh, this means that there is low choice, uh, restriction exists and um, international commitments have not been made or if they were made, they are not on track. And there is no budget line on family planning and high donor dependency. Um, so um, overall, what we found is that only 39 countries have some kind of strategy, national commodity strategy, and 29 countries, that is a bit more than a half, have funds. So even if there is a policy often, so you can see 39 countries have strategy, but only 29 have funds, so it means half. So it means policies exist, but they are not funded. And that means they can't be really implemented. And um, yeah, so I wanted also to point out that, of course, each of our atlas, also this atlas, we uh, do it in the collaboration with the experts. So for this atlas, we involved uh, experts on the continent. Uh, we applied our methodology, but the expertise came from, from the continent. Of course, um, we worked with academia, uh, with universities, with uh, politicians, with civil society organizations that helped us create the the questions and rate them also. And um, 
I don't know, should I um, talk about some recommendations or do you have questions? Yeah, I do have some questions. I mean, I, I looked at the Atlas uh, a little bit um, and uh, thank you so much again for your, for your work. Um, but I, I wrote, uh, no, I read that about 60 million women in um, Africa use uh, modern contraception methods and 50 million have an unmet need for modern methods, right? Meaning they want to prevent pregnancy, but they're not, they're not using contraception. Um, and the, the trend goes in the direction that there's going to be more and more women who are going to have a need uh, for contraception and that is not going to be met uh, by 2030 the, the number was 73.5 million women much more than today um, how do African countries plan to counter this trend or what are the recommendations at EPF uh, so um, based on the recommendation of the experts um, first of all uh, some of the uh, documents that are very important to mention is that uh, that the commitment of, of the states is there and uh, universal access to contraception is asserted in African Union policy and legal frameworks. For example, there is Agenda 2063, Africa Blueprint for the Future. There is a Maputo Protocol and um, general comments. And there is um, a Maputo Plan of Action. And of course, there is um, 2014 Addis Ababa Declaration on Population Development. and um, just to, in 2019, there was a Nairobi summit on the uh, implementation of the ICPD, which is the main document uh, on the uh, population and development. So the commitment is there. Now uh, it needs to be implemented. Yes, yeah, this is always the, the issue. Also in Europe, we have countries that have very good policies, but they are not implemented. So the the recommendations from this group of experts based on the findings were that, first of all, the protocols that exist have to be domesticated into national policies, that there will, will be domestic financing, not dependency on international donors, because as soon as the donor withdraw, the situation um, becomes very, very difficult. And that there is a state reporting and systematic assessment of progress. So what, what we are looking into, and I hope we can do it, that we will uh, update this atlas because this is already two years old. So, and then we can maybe also as civil society hold the governments uh, accountable jointly with the civil society on the, on the African continent. And of course, um, address the restriction to access and um, we need always disaggregated data. This is very much missing. So these are some of the thoughts to share. Yeah, thank you mm -hmm. so much, Marina. Do you also have some data for male contraception? Because contraception? I think Rosemary, um, I think that's what she meant, hopefully. Rosemary, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, do you have any data on male contraception in African countries? So in terms of uh, what is funded, uh, we, as, as usual, we look at all that are available and we just look at what governments do uh, in, uh, in terms of providing them on, at less cost or free of charge. In terms of uptake of the uh, contraception, this is not uh, this research. We would need to look at the UN data maybe, but I can look it up and we can have a look later on maybe. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Rosemary, I hope that answered your question a little bit. If not, please feel free to um, let us know in the chat. Um, Heather, a lot of unwanted pregnancies, um, they could also be prevented if only there were more contraceptive for men, as you said. Um, what are the types of uh, models uh, here that are being developed at the moment? We, I mean, Jana talked a little bit about two methods that are known um, the most, which is the condom and the vasectomy, but what else is there? Um, currently available, nothing, unfortunately, but um, in development, we break, uh, so most of the development on the male side is in the very early stages still. So um, the nearest to market it are what we call the vasoclusive methods which would indeed act like a reversible vasectomy. So that's a product that um, is an injection of a polymer into the vas deferens, and then that would biodegrade or have some other mechanism of reversibility 
um, that would offer what a vasectomy doesn't, since a vasectomy is meant to be permanent. Um, so those products are probably looking at a, a five plus year horizon before they'd be on the market. Um, and that's considered fast because they would be hopefully regulated as a device. Um, and there are clinical trials starting on one of these products called Atom that um, uh, in Australia, they're starting um, first in human is what they call those trials. So initial safety assessments in humans. Um, beyond that, really the formulation is yet to be seen. So they're finding, the researchers are finding um, molecules and targets that are um, promising and how they would be delivered is, you know, option that we're discussing. So it could be a pill, it could be an injectable, it could be an implant, much like what we see with women's methods. But we're also, you know, one of the things that we really embrace at MCI is that being the underdog, so to speak, and coming to this late in the game and underfunded, it, you know, you have that opportunity to disrupt a bit, right? So we consider that a lot. And like, you know, we do a lot of um, promotion and conduct of human-centered research. So, you know, we can do so much more um, in drug delivery these days. We've heard about microarray patches, which, you know, who knows, could that be turned into a tattoo? Like contraception could be fun, right? So the delivery mechanisms I like to, to really think about, but um, at the very basic level, we would see them hopefully mirror what we see with female contraception. As far as mechanism of action, we really group them into four categories. Targeting spermatogenesis, which is how the sperm is formed. Um, an important aspect for us at Male Contraceptive Initiative is we fund products that are what we call post-meiotic, which means the sperm cells are already produced. They just haven't matured. Um, and that's important to us around ensuring um, reversibility without any downstream effects. Um, so you're preventing any sort of potential mutation issues or anything like that. So post-myotic spermatogenesis development of sperm. Second bucket, bucket that we fund in is around sperm motility. So how can you, you know, alter how sperm swim so that they aren't effective at, um, at fertilization? Um, there's literal fertilization where we look at, you know, there's this important step called capacitation where the sperm changes its morphology to be able to penetrate the egg for fertilization. So some of the products in development target that. Um, and then the fourth bucket for us is sperm transport, which is how the sperm are ejaculated from the man. So that's where like our vast occlusive products would come into play. So those, those are the four big areas that we're looking at for male contraceptive product development on the non-hormonal non side, at least. And then, as I said, the delivery mechanisms, you know, are still to be determined. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I mean, Heather, um, I'm picking up a question from the, from the audience. And since now we're at 3 p.m., I'm also opening, officially opening the floor up to uh, more questions in the chat. So feel free to gather your thoughts and um, write down whatever it is that you are curious about. Um, I think we've had a quite a very lively debate going on in the chat, which I'm very, very um, excited about and thankful for. Um, Heather, I think this is a question for you, in my opinion, but perhaps it is also a question for everybody else on, on the stage. Um, I'll, I'll read it out loud. Since the last time we have talked about um, forced sterilization for women living with HIV, last time meaning um, last panel, um, is there any data on marginalized groups and provision of contraception for them, not only young people, that is not invasive or forced? Um, for example, for people with disabilities or other minority groups, is there any data at all? Um, there are, I, I think it's fair to say limited data. Um, and there's, again, on the male side, virtually none. I will say back to my, my sort of little wink to the disruption side of this, that's one of the things we're really interested in because we talk about the global South, which is, you know, I, I've spent many years working in contraceptive development in that space. Everything that you mentioned up to now is true. You know, there's this history that we have to be very aware of and we have to make sure that we don't repeat the same mistakes. 
but I also live in the South in the United States. So it's a very real issue in our community as well. I mean, the African-American population in the state I live in, North Carolina, are still settling um, lawsuits related to eugenics. I mean, this isn't that far in, unfortunately, in our past. So we can't let it be a part of our future. And so being inclusive and thoughtful about all of the different populations that exist is so critical. And I'll say one of the things that is particularly interesting for us is that, you know, we keep talking about contraception as female contraception and then male contraception, but it's really one spectrum of contraception for anyone to use. And when you think of it that way, you start to really materialize a vision of those folks that are sort of in the middle, right? That aren't in the binary, that are also experiencing unintended pregnancies. So having non-hormonal methods for that population is also important. So I think that as we think more inclusively about contraception, we should, and it should be relatively organic for us to truly think inclusively across all populations. Um, and we do need more data around that. Yeah, thank you so much. Marina, Yana, do you want to add to this? It's totally okay if, if no. I can say, I can say just maybe uh, that um, there was a research on uh, uh, for forced sterilization of Roma women. And this is uh, in, in Slovakia. And uh, this is a very worrying and very sad situation because also many of those women are not educated enough to access the justice system or even to understand what happened to them. So, and I know that many civil society organizations um, in those countries have been following this and um, represent, uh, assisting those women to access justice. So I think it's very important that um, we also work with civil society who takes care of that, who have lawyers who can get justice to those women and also put the systems that have led to this under big question. Yeah, yeah thank you so much. I can I can add to something that uh, Heather yeah. said, which is very important also um, about the people in the non-binary, like um, especially um, people who transitioned or are in transitioning. For them, the contraception situation is super unclear, and also at least that's how I heard it in Germany from the German um, trans association that um, a lot of doctors force or recommend highly a sterilization of transgender people, even if there's no medical reason at all. So a lot of transgender people are, are talked into this, even if there's no medical reason. And um, that's super sad. That's something that has to be put on the agenda, also politically in media. That's something that's never talked about. That's um, a huge problem, I guess. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to speak a little bit about you know, some, well, you're all, you're all very constructive women. You're all suggesting policies um, or you're all moving the, the discussion um, forward. Um, Heather, how do you view pharmaceutical companies and governments with respect to contraception? What role should they play? And what are you doing on that front? Um, I will say, I'll tell you my, my first answer, which is our goal is to get these methods, you know, again, reversible non-hormonal male methods to market as quickly as possible. So we, you know, right now the gold standard to do that is to develop them to a point where pharmaceutical industries are interested enough to engage or they see a market potential to engage and then take them the rest of the way. However, back to my disruption point, we're also very interested in how we can disrupt that approach as well. This is an opportunity in many ways, particularly I'll say with non-hormonal non methods, are there ways that we can, we can rewrite that path in a way that comes out? So, you know, so as I mentioned, the gold standard is for pharma to take it. And then when you talk about making global access and global pricing an option, that's also sort of this 
traditional approach of charging more in Western countries or higher income countries to offset the cost reduction in other countries. But everyone needs access to contraception. There are poor people in you know, wealthier countries. So why can't we make these methods available at a low cost right out of the gate? Why do we need to continue to have these exorbitant cost structures that you know, ostensibly have been put in place to offset R&D costs. That's the story of, of why traditionally pharmaceutical products cost so much. However, that, that doesn't apply to contraception. These methods were not paid for by pharmaceutical companies. So I, I, I walk a line with that between my personal interest and my interest in making sure that we, you know, we're not you know, shooting ourselves in the proverbial foot. Like we need to get these methods out there. But I think at a very minimum, we should be questioning and pushing on the cost conversation because there's delays that come with these cost structures um, and these, these dual pricing structures. And, and we can't tolerate that anymore. We're a global community. We need to view our, our partners, our, our, you know, our brothers, our sisters, our friends around the world as equal. And the one way that we can do that is through pricing of these commodities. Um, and then I, I, you know, that ties right into policy, correct? And it's very hard to be talking, you know, optimistically about any sort of reproductive policy right now sitting in the U.S., but I would like to see that, you know, these policies would come part and parcel with that. Like, we could develop policies that help push a little bit more towards equity and pricing and access and those sorts of things. So I guess I, I apologize. Most of my, my answer to this is, is prospective and hopeful versus, you know, what the real plan is. But right now the plan is to do the status quo, but we're still hoping that we can change that as well. Thank you. Marina, you also, you, you will write a lot of recommendations for countries. And you said that for one of the problem is that that the countries do not really implement them. Um, how many of those recommendations go kind of unanswered? Um, and what role should governments, in your opinion, play here? Um, yes, so um, first of all, yeah, of course it is um, uh, yeah, sad to know that what we do often is to, uh, to next to the, to the atlas on policies, we look at the real uptake. So sometimes these maps do not correspond. So what we do is we work, of course, with members of parliament to hold their governments accountable because that is the role of parliamentarians. And um, so I'm happy to say that um, this is happening, uh, for example, at EU level uh, last year. And in fact, we are celebrating this month's one year anniversary from the adoption of a very important EU uh, Parliament report that was called uh, uh, the report uh, on the situation of sexual reproductive health and rights in the European Union. And uh, it was a groundbreaking report because even though European Parliament has on many occasions um, uh, stated its position on uh, its concern on, on the lack of gender equality, on the lack of access, on the backlash that we observe, uh, there has not been any uh, o overarching paper on this. And last year it was adopted. I will put a link afterwards, which is um, called Matic Report. Matic because it was authored by the Croatian parliamentarian, very progressive and um, a big activist for women's rights. And so uh, this report has a whole chapter, in fact, on, on uh, uh, making, con uh, making con contraception that shows that the contraception is part of gender equality overall, and that is, it's, it's very important to ensure it. And um, uh, it calls on governments to, um, uh, to, uh, to ensure that they, first of all, inform their citizens that there is evidence-based information, but also that barriers such as costs are removed. So what we are uh, hoping to do, and we are calling on parliamentarians, not only in, in Euro at the European level, but also at national level, is to see what has happened since one year of adoption of, of this report. Has those recommendations been uh, taken into account? And if not, then 
Why not? What can EU do? Because EU does a lot on um, sharing best practices. So why are we in, in, in the continent where um, there is such a big difference? You know, you have even in the EU really red category countries and very uh, green countries. So uh, how can we... Uh, um, come to the situation where the, the best practices from Western countries are also um, followed by the, by our neighbors. And yeah. what is what is the, the challenge there? So, yeah, thank you so much. I mean, it's extremely important, right? We had we had we've received one comment from Alvin, who also thank you for the update on the Africa Atlas, but who also uh, shared with us that. Um, the Ministry of Health in Kenya is currently launching a policy that is limiting access, um, uptake of contraceptives in Kenya, and that requires consent from parents. Um, I mean, it's extremely important to follow up with uh, countries and government initiatives and measures that are being taken. Um, so I hope you do that. I hope you do the same for the Africa Atlas as well to check up on how many of those recommendations have been. Um, yeah, have been implemented. Um, we've also received another comment that also the Ministry of Health in Kenya is warning healthcare workers with imprisonment if they offer contraceptives. It's extremely alarming. Uh, thank you, Alvin, for those comments. Um, I have another question for Jana, since we all just talked about policies and, and making change and trying to, um, yeah, influence politics. Uh, a lot of the times as well. Uh, Jana, you did that with better birth control. Um, you recently, you managed to integrate your demands into the German coalition treaty of 2021. Heather talked about the power of young people. I think that's where we see the power of young people. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit about this extreme uh, achievement? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, we made it. And when I talk about it, sometimes I can't believe it myself that it actually worked out. Uh, we kind of had this plan from the beginning when we launched the campaign in the beginning of 2020, because we knew that the election was coming up a year later and we knew that's a critical phase for parties to create their party programs for the elections and so on. It's a very political phase of the, of the yeah, um, decade or, well, um, how did we do it? Well, we and uh, now um, also um, Heather also mentioned it. What way is there to make it happen that actually something happens? And first, we also wanted to work together with pharmaceutical industries, but talking to them was not as easy as talking to politics and um, research. For example, academia was really interested in our campaign also, or in our demands. Um, and now we try to find a way to maybe create research institutes in Germany with these this, this money that has been promised um, so to make a public private mix to bring a new product or new products on the market and to improve the products that are there. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, again, um, congratulations. That is quite the, the milestone. <laughs> Um, Marina, I don't know if you've seen in the comment, um, or Jana, you as well, but one of our panelists from last time um, which has also joined the chat, Promise, welcome Promise. Um, uh, she's also asked a question that was initially directed at Jana, so perhaps I, I, I give it to both of you. And um, she asked, do you include um, Depo Provera? in your campaign that was initially um, directed at you, Jana. Um, the injustice is that is it banned? It is banned in many countries in the north, um, in the global north, and it has been well, it has, has been subject to class action litigation for decades, the latest one in Canada in 2021. Um, but uh, Deepo Provera is still distributed to poor black women in the global south. Um, can you comment on that? I already replied uh, with a direct message in the chat to promise um unfortunately we didn't work on that yet but um it would be great to talk about that outside of the panel but maybe you have more information on that Marina. it's good if you guys connected with with each other <laughs> marina do you have um any research here that you could direct us um or uh, anything of that sort to help out promise in that sense 
No, unfortunately, I don't have it, but I can contact my colleagues in, in Kenya and I will I can get back to, to you. Yeah. That's great. I think Promise is in South Africa. So perhaps if you could contact your colleagues in South Africa. Um, I'm sure Promise can send you an email um, if, uh, if uh, she would like to get more information. Yeah, yeah, I will put my email in the in the chat so we can. That'd be great, and I, I'm, I'll be happy to um, to take any questions afterwards. Yeah. But um, you're gonna you're gonna have to watch your inbox, Marina. I think you're gonna have you're gonna get a lot of questions. <laughs> also, to the both of you, Heather and Jana, as well. Um, I have um, another question for um, Jana. Um, Josh uh, commented or um, sent a question about stigmatization of contraception um, and the termination of pregnancy, right? So, um, I mean, we're in Germany and I, and I grew up uh, in Bavaria, so one of the more conservative places in Germany. Um, there is definitely stigmatization of contraception of termination of pregnancy as well as in Europe and in Germany. Um, what do you think, what is the role here? Um, what is the role of, of that uh, with regards to contra, um, with regards to the, our discussion today? Um, well, I'm also from Bavaria, by the way, uh, uh, close to the border. Hello. So I, I suffer <laughs> with you in that, like, um, I feel it. Bavaria is like the Texas of Germany. If people are not familiar <laughs> uh, with Germany. Um, yeah, um, well, st yeah, the stigmatization is a big problem, especially also when it comes to contraception, because where we first learn about contraception is usually school or parents, but having this stigmatization and talk about sex and everything, um, I think my headphones just, I don't know, I hope you can still hear me. Yeah. yeah. Um, um yeah like this is the first problem because in school everyone's ashamed even the the teachers that should be trained in that but we all know it it's mostly not good these sex education classes um and also parents don't dare to talk to their children about sex and contraception so it's a huge problem it's a huge problem about it's the first step of education um, and um, same goes for um, abortions, I guess. Yeah. Heather, there's a lot going on in your country at the moment. <laughs> well, <laughs> what about, what about uh, how does it look like in the US? Um, what role does, um, let's say, um, the conservative parts of society play? Um, how much happens here in the contraceptive market or in the, around the discussion on contraception? You know, I, this is, you know, it's a huge conversation, obviously, around the Roe versus Wade, just, you know, the, the elephant in the room. Um, but in the day-to-day -day aspects of development of methods, I, you know, it, it, the last time we really saw it play out was around um, our inclusion of contraceptive coverage under our Affordable Care Act. So that was the first time that there was really a requirement to cover contraceptive methods. Interestingly, male methods are not covered under the Affordable Care Act. So vasectomy and condoms are not, are not reimbursed or covered under our insurance. Um, and then there was also pushback on that with um, religious and you know, more conservative folks um, wanting an exception or you know, to be able to bow out of the requirement of providing these methods in their um, insurance policies for their employees. So the conversation is there. Um, again, I'm hoping that by having more men at the table in a conversation around contraception, around preventing unintended pregnancy and, and really understanding that there's a role for everyone to play can, you know, maybe bring the, the conversation to a less politically heated space. I mean, I think that a lot of it is the unknown. Yana brought up such a good point. We have, you know, it's it's funny, not funny, but this joke that, you know, our, our team has traveled quite extensively 
talking to people about male contraception and female contraception. And what we keep hearing is the universality of poor sex education. And I feel like that is the root cause of everything. Everyone has some story, no matter where you're from, it's really remarkable in Africa, in India, you know, in Texas, <laughs> in Bavaria, you have conversations where a lot of times boys and girls are separated. They're told, you know, the birds and the bees as it is, they might be shown how to put a condom on a banana. And then you come out and you can't look at each other for a week because you're all mortified and you still don't know what's happening. So that's something that we also, and I have to give a shout out to our communications director, Kevin, because He's done this essentially single-handedly because he was so moved by the, the consistency of the story that he has developed these primers on our website about male reproductive tract. So we have every detailed nuance of male reproductive anatomy. There is a, a little cartoon and there's a blog and you know all of the content we put out there, the sexy research and development and the stuff we love, our biggest hitting at communications asset that we've put out is a video on YouTube about the blood testis barrier that has had over 30,000 views. I mean, we just couldn't believe it, but it just shows people don't know, you know, women think of how, you know, we're sexualized and we're, we go to OBGYNs early, like our reproductive journey is pretty much put out there and, and and to all of our discussion often tried to be controlled throughout our lives, whereas men's isn't even discussed. So they don't have the slightest idea how things work in many cases. And it's hard to admit that. Like, so we try to be very forward and say, don't worry, we didn't know either. We're learning as we're creating these, these videos. So I think that that is a huge point is to go back to the basics and inform people, because I think a lot of the political debate and the and the fear and the, you know, the, the misrepresentation around reproductive rights comes from a profound lack of understanding. Thank you so much, Heather, for sharing that. Um, Marina, you're in Barbados. We talked a lot about Europe, Africa, um, North America, well, the US, <laughs> not Mexico, but um, we didn't really talk about Asia and Latin America. Um, but you're at a conference for, uh, well, for contraception, about contraception in Latin America. What, uh, can you share anything with us, a little bit, some of the findings, some of the topics or the trends that are being discussed there? Yes, sure. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, in fact, the conference will start now at just when we will finish. So I will run there. Uh, but the conference is um, about um, uh, reducing unwanted pregnancies. The issues that uh, so in this region, in the Latin America um, uh, and Caribbean, and the issues that here also, just as in many parts of the world, the policies are are quite good. At the same time, still the, uh, the levels of teenage unwanted pregnancies are uh, quite high, very, very worrying. And um, especially in the lower um, economical spheres of population. So the, uh, what we will look at is uh, what can governments do to reduce those barriers again to contraception, to information, and to make sure that young people can enjoy their, their well-being. Also, we are we are hoping to we are now working on on the atlas for Latin America. So we hope to uh, launch it next year, so we can have a more holistic picture of the whole world. But what is very interesting that uh, some countries in Latin America are including uh, access to contraception in their constitutions. This is not something we have anywhere else. So it shows the, the commitment. Uh, it shows that there is a will that people also support it, but the, as usual, the situation, in, the real situation sometimes is not um, uh, as rosy as on, on the law, on the, on the legal side. Yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, that's what, that was actually one of my questions to you, Marina, what was next? Uh, <laughs> so now you're working on the Atlas for uh, Latin America. I'm so happy about that. Uh, maybe one last question before you, before you run off to the conference. Um, Maybe also this is a, one of you know the question for everybody. How can we advocate more to governments? Um, 
to you know to pick up this topic and to really to make it their own to to really push the push the discussion forward how can we do that um shall i con continue yes you can start if yeah. you want to you, you i know you got okay. pressure <laughs> okay uh, so for us it's of course th these atlases were um, are are this tool to advocate because um sometimes the pol the, the health policies it's it's 100 pages of documents and this is an attempt to visualize it and then of course um to um to ask governments why are are other neighboring states that are economically just as well as we are are scoring better and another thing that i want to mention is the current um to debunk the myths uh, around contraception which already um, my co my co-panelists co mentioned uh today a lot of um uh, anti-choice or anti-human rights movements are using the argument of um, decline in fertility and demographic uh, challenges and um, negative uh, demographic growth as uh, a way to take away women's rights. So that means uh, let's not provide contraception, let's not provide, let's prohibit abortion, then we'll have more babies. And in fact, the Atlas uh, clearly shows, for example, I put here the list in the latest UN report, the countries in Europe that have negative population growth is Bulgaria, Latvia, Moldova, Ukraine, Croatia, Lithuania, Romania, Serbia, Hungary, and Poland. Sorry, that was fast. Uh, so exactly most of those countries are also uh, scoring red in our atlas. So that means countries that don't give rights to women are also having uh, less uh, fertility rates and the countries that are green, for example, Nordic countries or or um, France, Belgium, or, um, uh, UK, they have quite good fertility rates. So there is no correlation in um, the, the correlation shows that the more rights women have, the better their well-being is. Then um, the the more they will decide families and women also to, they will decide to 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 have children. So we need to take this maybe as, as a message whenever we hear these anti-choice statements. Yeah, so much. Jana. Yeah, um, thank you for your insights and statement. Um, it was really interesting. I think uh, what a problem about advocating more contraception policies, a, a huge problem in this is the patriarchy. And I, I'm wondering that we haven't mentioned that yet. I think the words, like no one said that word before, but that we have power structures in politics, in the pharmaceutical industry, everywhere where old white men are on top. Old white men that have not been educated about contraception, about reproduction and their part and their responsibility in reproduction. That's the main issue. But I feel, or maybe I'm, I'm optimistic and I'm hopeful, but I feel, that the system is slowly changing. And there are women and there are young, progressive, forward-thinking males also in the debate who accept and acknowledge their responsibility in reproduction. And there are so many good, intelligent, young women in there. And to make to make a change, to make politics happen, we have to address those people. I think the old white men, we can give up on them. They, they won't change, they won't change their beliefs anymore. I think it's a waste of time to talk to them, to be honest, but we have to address these young, progressive, good politicians or people in, in powerful positions, wherever. If it is research, pharmaceutical industry, politics, it doesn't matter. We have to address those people. And from there, it has to go up and up and up and up. Um, but yeah, I think that's the key to change, I feel. Thank you so much for saying patriarchy. I'm, I'm actually shocked that we didn't use that word yet. <laughs> Heather, the, the stage is yours. I, I have to say, I can't say it better than Yana just did. That was brilliantly stated and I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's prevalent in all the systems and it's a foundational issue with everything we've talked about today, so. Well, in that uh, sense, thank you so much to all three um, panelists, Marina, Jana, Heather, thank you so, so much. I've learned so much. I hope um, everybody in the audience as well. Um, I, 
will also say Marina has worked on an atlas on abortion as well. Um, I would love to point to this in the chat. Um, and I'm mentioning this uh, only because we are going to be talking about abortion next time when we meet again um, on reframing reproduction here in our discussion series. In two weeks, we're going to be talking about abortion. So you, you have uh, no excuse to not attend this event. Uh, 